No, it still won't kick start. You're sorry. I'm sorry. I'm running out of energy up here. No, I haven't finished all the popcorn. Roger Houston, understand I should plant some of it. In some ways, our planet Earth is like a spaceship. Energy constantly flows within it. Since no transfer of energy is 100% efficient, some energy becomes useless heat dispersed throughout the system. This disordering of energy, or entropy, threatens a spaceship. And in the same way, threatens Earth. Life depends on the reversal of entropy. Why? Well, life feeds on free energy. That is, energy available to do work. Glucose, for example, is a vital source of free energy. Think of a glucose molecule as a stone perched on top of a hill, where it possesses more energy than the same stone at the bottom of the hill. As the glucose rolls down the hill, changing chemical form, it releases energy as heat and transfers energy to other molecules which fuel life. This downhill rolling increases entropy. At the bottom of the hill, the new molecules have lost almost all their free energy. Sugar is essential to life, but there are no natural deposits of sugar on Earth. Sugar mines which we can tap for free energy. Life on Earth is faced with a fundamental task to somehow push the molecules back up the hill, reverse the entropy, and reorder matter. To accomplish this, energy must come from outside the system. Sunlight. How does it happen? For centuries, scientists have known that sunlight transmits energy. Take water, for example. Pure water either reflects or transmits virtually all radiation from the sun. But in practice, most water contains impurities. So when it is exposed to sunlight, it absorbs radiant heat. It becomes warmer. Life on Earth depends on this radiant heat energy. There is, however, another kind of energy transfer which can be detected using a special substance added to water. An extract from the leaves of green plants. In sunlight, radiant heat energy is absorbed as before. But more, the mixture begins to fluoresce or give off visible light. Why don't we see the same fluorescence when light strikes leaves? Well, if we did, life as we know it could not possibly exist. This fluorescence is caused by a substance which captures certain wavelengths of visible light. Chlorophyll is the name of the substance. In a drop of water, the chlorophyll has nowhere to transfer energy, except to re-radiate it as visible light. But in a leaf, the energy can be transferred to other molecules to eventually create energy storage molecules, such as glucose. These fuel the many energy transfers of life. In 1796, the Austrian physician, Ingenhaus, developed the basis of a general equation for this photosynthesis reaction, which is still useful today. Within certain plant cells, carbon dioxide plus water in the presence of sunlight and chlorophyll produce organic matter such as glucose plus oxygen and water. This equation is a simple shorthand for what we know to be a very complex series of chemical reactions. As scientists began to explore photosynthesis, they discovered two kinds of chlorophyll which absorbs slightly different wavelengths of light. Since oxygen is a byproduct of the reaction, photosynthesis can be studied by examining the rate of oxygen output at different wavelengths. 
As these graphs show, little green light is absorbed. Instead, it is reflected and accounts for the color we so often see in plants. Year by year, scientists probe deeper and deeper into the plant leaf to unravel the mystery of photosynthesis. Not all plant cells contain chlorophyll. Those which do have chloroplasts, in which chlorophyll is found. Each chloroplast is actually a series of stacks of grana, which are flattened sacs. Within the individual sacs, called thylakoids, an important part of the photosynthesis reaction takes place. This part of the reaction is centered in two distinct complexes of molecules, or photosystems, within each thylakoid, and depends on light. Imagine that the screen is a scale of free energy. More at the top, less at the bottom. One photosystem, called P680, acts as a kind of springboard for an electron. The photon of light is the hammer which drives the electron to a higher energy level. Carrier molecules transport the electron. This process forms ATP molecules. On a second springboard, called P700, a photon hammer drives the electron to yet a higher level of energy. As it loses energy in transport, it loads up another energy carrier molecule, NADP, with hydrogen ions. These energy carrier molecules are the key product of the light reaction. They apparently move across the thylakoid membrane into the stroma, the fluid surrounding the thylakoid. Within the stroma, a second reaction sequence occurs, called the dark reaction, because it is independent of light. The dark reaction converts carbon dioxide into glucose. The American scientist Melvin Calvin received a Nobel Prize for his work in describing the chemistry of the dark reaction. Imagine a spinning top with a cycle of complex chemical reactions taking place around its rim. Carbon dioxide is the basic building block of these reactions. The cycle is powered by ATP, to which is added NADP and hydrogen, all supplied by the light reaction. Every six cycles, a glucose molecule is produced. reaction and the light reaction cannot be a hundred percent efficient. Nevertheless, the light reaction traps free energy from the sun to power the dark reaction. Together, they are photosynthesis. Photosynthesis produces both a vital byproduct, oxygen, and enough extra energy to fuel the energy-expensive reactions of plant respiration. Even when this cycle is complete, not all the plant energy is used up. The extra energy stored in this cycle is the foundation of all other life, including our own. Entropy is held at bay on Earth by photosynthesis in plants. <laughs>